art instructor or the teacher, if we drew, if we, if we drew anything uh, ending, <laughs> she'd tear it up on us. You know? It had to be uh, everything uh, the uh, European way, you know. And, uh, but we, uh, we drew them anyway. We drew them in the dirt when we were out in the hills of summers, you know. The school system was nothing less than an attempt to supplant a whole people's history and sense of identity with someone else's. Missionaries and government officials set out to destroy native cultures at the root. To prevent them being passed on to future generations, they tried to eradicate the Indians' languages. One of the favorite punishments of some of the Jesuits was to take the, the young people, if they were caught speaking their language, and force them to bite down on a very large rubber band and bite down as tight as they could. And then the rubber band would be stretched out as far as they could stretch it without it popping from his mouth and then released and it was smashed back into his face or her face and uh, that was one way they tried to break us from speaking our own language if you talk in Indian in the classroom they'll uh, they'll bend the ruler and hit you in the mouth that really hurts but I keep forgetting like you talk Indian and that's when I took me in the room and hit me in the back with, I don't know what it is, I think it's a razor strap. That really hurts. We missed uh, forget and speak Indian while well, they took us in the room, whip us. Yeah. And so it was cruel. I mean, it's, I don't know, I couldn't understand I, at first, you know. I thought I'd come here to learn and they'd come and use a whip on us, you know. And it's cruel. Like generations of whites before them, the school authorities saw Indian culture as primitive and worthless. They believed that the Indian must be killed to save the man. But some of the children refused to allow the Indian in them to be killed. Despite the attempt to make them forget who they were, many of them managed to cling on to their identity. At night, I would relive every conversation that I ever had with anybody in Lakota back home. My grandmother, my grandfather, my friends, my uncles, everybody. What we did is all of us at the same tribe, we get a pass and we go way out in the hills. We sit in a circle and we talk Indian, yeah, with our language. So we won't lose it. Other children were less resilient. Many of them ran away. Some schools offered a $5 reward for their return, and often they were rounded up like stray animals and brought back. Hundreds of the pupils died from brutality and disease. Epidemics of tuberculosis and influenza swept through the schools, killing children with no resistance to white illnesses. Often there was no physical cause of death at all. Mystified doctors would watch children simply wasting away. Well, there's one guy, and I went to see him at the hospital, and he was dying. And Dr. Kuhn seemed to find out what's wrong with it. But I think that, actually, he told me, I talked to him and said, I want to go home. I don't belong in this place. He said, I want to go back to my people. And I think that, actually, if you come right down to reality, I think that, He's, he's not, he didn't have no kind of a sickness except that he is lonesome. And finally, he died with loneliness. At that time, it was really rough. I've seen people, young men's backs broke. I've seen young men's necks broke. I've seen a young man's hip bone kicked out of place and it healed like that and they called him stiffy his hip bone healed so he couldn't move it and he ran with the rest of us like that and they called him stiffy <laughs> 
During the 1920s, it became increasingly clear that the policy of allotment and forced assimilation had been a disaster. Far from helping Indians to make the transition into white American life, it had left thousands of them destitute. In 1933, John Collier became Commissioner for Indian Affairs. With his Indian New Deal, he tried to halt the erosion of the Indian land base. For 13 years, he succeeded. But in 1947, Congress voted to replace his reforms with a new policy, termination and relocation. Under termination, the government was to liberate the Indians by ending their tribal status and withdrawing federal protection of their lands. But many Indians believed that, like allotment, the new policy was motivated more by greed than idealism. In eight years, more than 100 Indian groups were terminated. At the same time, thousands of Indians were relocated to the cities where they were promised houses and jobs. The aim was to make them share in the American dream. The reality for many of them was homesickness, discrimination and unemployment. The tribes protested that the new policy was simply repeating the mistakes of allotment. In 1970, they persuaded President Nixon to abandon it. But the attempt to eliminate the Indians by social engineering had created deep-rooted problems. The long fight for survival had left the tribes insecure, exhausted and divided. In 1973, these problems erupted violently at Wounded Knee in South Dakota. America was startled. The Indians had suddenly reappeared from the past. The Wounded Knee Siege was one of the worst civil disturbances in modern US history. It temporarily brought Indians back into the American consciousness. Many young Americans, troubled by the Vietnam War, found it easy to identify with native people. Others were angered by the Indians' militancy. But Wounded Knee starkly showed that native people had survived the attempt to destroy them. After 400 years of genocide and a century of assimilation, the Indians have still not disappeared from the United States. Today, there are more than 1.8 million of them living in hundreds of different communities. Events like the powwow, when Indians from different parts of the country gather to socialize and to dance, help to strengthen their sense of identity. Tribes divided by history into separate reservations can still come together to practice their culture. But this survival has been at enormous cost. Today's American Indians are the poorest ethnic group in the United States. About half of them still live on reservations that are crippled by poverty and social problems. And successive government policies have left many Indians trapped in a cultural limbo, caught between two very different worlds and two very different identities. You're this being. You have no culture of your own because in some ways it's been so altered or extracted from you that you can't obtain or hold that. On the other hand, you can't turn around and embrace something that has destroyed you. How can you just lie to yourself? I mean, say, oops, it didn't happen, and just click this part of you off and then just supplant another whole system inside of you. So you end up being, you know, an empty cultural vessel. I think in each and every one of us there's a deep inner resentment uh, for white people. That in itself would be okay if you could figure out a way to define it so you would not um, vent that anger towards yourself. I think that's the real tragedy and the real crime is that you don't vent it necessarily towards the people that you resent because after all part of the struggle is they're the ones that are going to save you. I mean this is part of the part of the thing that that you you can't define and so what happens is you conclude and say it must be me.